morning. We are blessed to have Miriam Brown come and share this message. Miriam is a mum, she's a wife, she's a Christian psychologist and counsellor. Miriam has come and spoken at our ladies' events a few times now, and this morning we are really excited to have her come and share the message. So, mums, if you're out there, grab your Mother's Day marks, grab your Mother's Day slippers, and everyone else. Sit back and enjoy this morning's message. One of the realities of this pandemic is that rituals that we are used to and need for significant life events are no longer available, they're restricted. So rituals for celebration, as Mother's Day is for some people, and rituals for loss and lament and comfort, which Mother's Day is for some other people, are not available as they used to be. But we adapt, and in the last two months, we've become master practitioners at social distancing. And it's got me thinking, is it possible that we can fall into habits, maybe unintentionally, which lead to spiritual distancing? Is it possible for believers to self-isolate from God? That question has taken me back to the root word for religion. And as you can see, it's religio. And ligio means to join or connect, and re means again. And our word ligament comes from the same root word. So just as a ligament is a band of connective tissues that join bone to bone to form a joint, in the same way, the true purpose, the original purpose of religion is to connect or reconnect us with God, with others, with ourself, with creation. That's the true meaning. So I'd like to pose a question. Does the way you have shaped and you live out your faith draw you closer to that goal of connection or further away? If connection is the original purpose for religion, is the way we're living out our faith fit for purpose? Is it fulfilling its original purpose? So as the months and the years and the decades go by in our faith journey, do we find ourselves closer to God, more connected? Or is there a cooling or a hardening or a distancing happening? And how can we tell? Well, one writer, Kenneth Leach, helps us distinguish. He says, true religion helps us to grow, but pseudo-religion hinders growth, for it creates and maintains obstacles and barriers. Sounds like spiritual distancing. And Leach concludes that in religio, in true religion, there has to be a movement towards the still centre, the depths of our being, where we find the presence of God. Are we finding more and more of the presence of God in our faith journey? One book that's really helped me distinguish between true religion, religio, and pseudo-religion is by Sky Jathani, the book with. And in that he talks about five different faith postures that we can adopt. And what distinguishes those five postures is how we complete the statement. I am doing life, dot, 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 God. So you'll notice that there are four of those faith postures on the screen. And the first four are actual expressions of spiritual distancing. Rather than drawing us closer to God, they create some form of self-isolation from God. So I am doing life over, under, from, or for God. They're the first four. And Jasani says that we can determine what our faith posture is by looking at what is our treasure. In the fifth posture, we'll look at later, in true religion, our treasure is God himself, experiencing the presence of God. But in those other four faith postures, faith and even God become an end to a means, a means to an end, I'm sorry. So we use our faith, we use God to get something else that we need. 
As we explore these first four, I confess to you that I have drifted into each of them during my faith journey, and maybe you have too. So the first faith posture that Jathani talks about is doing life over God. And in this uh, faith posture, my treasure is control. How? By finding a formula that will manage life and control the outcomes. So it's based on the assumption that there's this set of beliefs and behaviours and when I find them, I'll gain some sort of control over my life and over the outcomes. I have wandered into this one, especially when there was an outcome that was really important to me. So let's give an example. Let's say you were given a really um, bad uh, diagnosis from a doctor, uh, terminal illness. Most of us would press into God. But if in pressing into God you happen to come across someone or something that told you, I uh, was diagnosed with a terminal illness and I did this. And then they present a certain set of um, principles or practices. Um, pray like this. Pray this much. Fast like this. And I was healed, they would say. Now, of course, because we're desperate, we will obviously take that on board. Now, there are dangers both ways, whether we're healed or not healed. Let's say we are healed. What ends up happening is there can become then, rather than a trust in God, it's a trust in the formula. I found the formula and I got it right. And uh, when I come across somebody else who might be experiencing one of those horrible diagnoses from a doctor, I could say, this is the way to healing. My trust is in a formula. But what if I'm not healed? I've worked with some people who have said, I, I did all that praying, I did what that person said, all the books said, and yet I'm not being healed. Why? What's happened? I thought I'd got it right. Does God have favourites? There's a lot of pain in that question. But also I think there is this belief that there's almost like a God code and some people, by finding just that right set of beliefs and behaviours, somehow crack the code, decipher the code. And there's an exclusive bunch of people who, who can do that. And if we could just find the right formula, we would be able to do that too. Jesus spoke to that and the folly of that. In one of his parables, we see Jesus talking about somebody who tried to do life over God by thinking that they'd found the formula. So in Luke 18 we read, The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Can't you hear the formula? It's like he's saying, I've found it, I've cracked the code. I've mastered this faith and God thing. I'm all over it. Did Jesus agree with him? Did Jesus say, after telling that story of that Pharisee, now go and do likewise? No, he didn't. In fact, when we look at verse 9, it says, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Doing life over God, thinking I can find just the right formula, can lead to a sense of pride. Now, we all have our favourite writer and maybe even our favourite school of theology. But if we elevate that to a place where we think this is um, the formula for God, this is cracking the God code, I've worked it out, I'm all over this, you can see how in that there is a form of pride where we're in and others are out. I was reading Colossians where it says that in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The fullness of God can only be contained in Christ, not in anything else we come up with. So if I find something and think I've arrived if it might be a particular speaker or blogger or writer, it might be a particular school of theology, it might be a denomination, it might be a faith tradition, it might be a faith coalition. If I think that that is what contains God, 
that is a form of pride. Now, there have been times in my life where I desperately would have loved to have been able to control the outcomes. And if somebody had said to me, I've got the formula, this is what you do, this is what you believe, this is how you behave, and you'll get what, what, you, what you desperately want, I would have crawled over broken glass to get that. But I've had to repent of that because I see that it doesn't draw me to the still centre and to the presence of God. It draws me to a place of pride and it distances me from God. And how could I possibly think that the God of the universe, the ancient of days, the great I am, can be reduced to a formula? There is no formula that can contain God. I found this poem. I used to think of you as a symphony, neatly structured, full of no surprises. But now I have come to see you as a saxophone solo blowing wildly into the night, a tongue of fire flicking in unexpected patterns. Jasani's second faith posture is I'm doing life under God. So what's my treasure here? To be safe and to be secure. So I will look for a set of beliefs, a set of behaviours that will guarantee that I will be safe in this world and my loved ones will be safe and my future is secured in the afterlife. And usually in an under God faith posture, there's a duty or a fear base. And as we go through this, we'll see that they cannot connect me more with God. They are forms of spiritual distancing. And how could they be anything else but that? Have you ever genuinely felt close to anyone that you feared or felt duty-bound to? Jesus gives us a wonderful case study of doing life under God from a basis of duty. And that's to be found in the prodigal son parable. Do you notice who Jesus positions at a distance from the father? It's not the prodigal son. It's the elder son, the one who has spent his life being dutiful, doing the right thing. But what we see is that rather than duty drawing him closer to the father, he actually resists the father's love, trusting more in his duty to get him what he believes he deserves, securing the future he believes he will get. Two books that have really helped me identify the elder son in myself are Timothy Keller's The Prodigal God and Henry Nouwen's The Return of the Prodigal Son. And in those two books, I can see times when I have, through duty, tried to serve God, but really what I was doing was trying to secure my own future, thinking that if I do this for God, then God will look after me. And inevitably, when I've drifted into that faith posture, I have found uh, I'm tempted to judge others who don't seem to be uh, serving as much as me or I've become resentful or bitter if God doesn't seem to be giving me the returns I deserve. Almost like that entitlement of, see how much I've done for you, God. Why aren't you giving me what I deserve? So just as a duty-based under God faith posture is using duty to try to get the things that I want, the good things, the fear-based form of being under God is using uh, obedience to avoid bad things happening. So I obey God, I follow God in order for bad things to not happen to me or to my loved ones. Obedience becomes like an insurance policy, making sure I'll be looked after in this life and I'll get the future afterlife that I want. I really get this, the desire for the safe life. In a world where the word unprecedented is being used at an unprecedented amount, in a world where there is so much fear and unpredictability, I really get this desire for a sense of, if I do this, then I'll be guaranteed safety or security. And I'm not surprised when history teaches us that it's during times of natural disaster or crises 
that fundamentalism grows. Throughout all the world's religions, fundamentalism grows in a time of crisis. It's almost like when we are fearful, we try to contain God, contain faith. We narrow the, the container for our faith. God in a box, faith in a box. When I'm tempted to do that, when I'm tempted to put God in a box to make me feel safe, I'm drawn back to C.S. Lewis. And you may remember in his Narnia stories, and particularly in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, there's one scene where the children realise for the first time that Aslan is not a person but a lion. And we read, He doesn't like being tied down, said Mrs Beaver. He's wild, you know, not like a tame lion. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Course he isn't safe, but he's good. The third faith posture that Jathani talks about is doing life from God. So my treasure is to have a comfortable life, the blessings of a good life. How? By making sure I become a member of God's club and getting the membership privileges. So my faith and even God become a means to this end. So how does this play out? Well, God's ultimate um, purpose is to be at my beck and call. God is my cosmic butler or my protector. God becomes my divine therapist or my happiness coach. God becomes, faith becomes, my vending machine. It's been called drive-through divinity. Or I see God as a benevolent, doting grandfather who just wants me to be happy. And my prayers become a wish list or a set of demands. The prosperity doctrine is an extreme, and I would say an obscene, expression of this, doing life from God. Because in this, I, in the prosperity doctrine, I think that God's top priority is my wealth and my health. But there are more subtle expressions of doing life from God. And we see that in this prayer. God, I'm ashamed to admit it, but here's my typical prayer. Make my life safe, comfortable and easy. Lead me away from the trials that might purify my faith, the difficulties that might teach me perseverance, and the temptations that might reveal my true allegiances. Please don't discipline me, because that may not be pleasant, and I want a pleasant life. I get this. In times in my life when I've been tired of the struggle, I have really craved a comfortable life. But at times like that, I've tried to remember that when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, deliver us from evil, not deliver us from difficulty or discomfort. And I also try to remember that doing life from God means I am pursuing the gifts and not the giver. It will inevitably be a form of spiritual distancing, not religio, not being connected to God. A fourth faith posture Jathani presents is doing life for God. Now surely this would draw me closer to God and certainly it's held up as the pinnacle of the Christian walk because my treasure is meaning and purpose by accomplishing great things in God's name. Now whilst this is good in itself, I have worked with enough burnt out pastors and missionaries to see the danger in this faith posture. Because if doing great things for God ends up putting the focus on the doing and less and less on pressing into the presence of God, what I find again and again is this weariness of spirit, this dryness that occurs, this leanness of soul that occurs. I find inevitably what tends to happen is 
We find our identity and our worth in our role, the things we do for God, rather than our purpose, rather than our identity, our worth being found in Christ. I find that joy and freedom are swallowed up. We become driven rather than being called. I can remember one day working with a pastor who realised that he had been doing life for God and how it had made his soul lean. And he said, I've been functioning like a soldier rather than a son. And I also remember working with a missionary and she was exhausted. And she said to me, I don't know how to be close to God anymore, but I know how to work hard for God. So I guess I'll just work a bit harder. She had lost connection with God by striving to work hard for God. When I'm tempted to go down that track, and it's very subtle, very seductive, I try to remember Jesus and the barbecue after the resurrection, and Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? From a position of love, of connection, now tend, now feed. It has to come out of the fullness of connection with God. So they are the first four faith postures, and maybe like me, you've drifted into each one of those. Doing life over God by believing right, thinking that that will give me a sense of control in my life through a formula. Doing life under God by behaving right, by obeying and serving, thinking that will guarantee safety and security. Doing life from God because I want to feel good, I want the comforts of life, and I think that God will look after his own and give me blessings and comfort. Doing life for God by doing good, hoping that will give me meaning and purpose. Whilst there might be some good in each of these and even truth in each of these, when I let them become the main way, the the way that defines my relationship with God, it takes me away from God. It's a form of spiritual distancing rather than religio, connection with God. And that leads us to the last faith posture in Jathani's book. And of course it is, I'm doing life with God. In this, God is my treasure. Being close to God is an end in itself. Connection with God. Moving from the stillness of the centre of my being into the presence of God becomes an end in itself. And what I've come to see is that this is what God treasures too. When we look at the name of God, Emmanuel, God with us. We see that God's heart is to do life with us. When we see in Jesus' words, abide in me, I am the vine, you are the branches. I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. We see in these words, Jesus articulating a life with him. And it's not surprising that the most requested psalm on people's deathbeds and at funerals is Psalm 23. The psalm about the withness of God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadows, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. This is doing life with God, when God becomes my treasure. This is not the if-then form of faith, of magical thinking. If I do this, then I'll get this. It is the even if form of faith. Even if I walk through the valley of shadows, you are with me, finding the with of God. At the beginning, I pose this question. Does the way you have shaped and live out your faith draw you closer to this goal of connection or further away? So after exploring Jasani's five faith postures, do you sense there is a need for some reshaping? Is there a possibility that, like me, you have drifted into one of the other four faith postures, a form of spiritual distancing, taking us away from the presence of God rather than religio, connection and reconnection with God? 
Are we moving towards a stillness where we know God more and more? This is my prayer. And I'd like us to conclude with this together. From Psalm 46, I invite you to repeat after me. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Go with God. Thanks, Miriam. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who longs to connect with us. Thank you that you are our Emmanuel. God with us. We pray that we may take comfort in that today. And Lord, we come to you now as an act of worship to say thank you. 